Hello and welcome to another episode of the Total Clarity Podcast. I'm Mike Varley. And I'm Jesse Hyatt. And we are back in Brooklyn, baby. We are back in our borough. That's right. We have uh, moved into the new year. Well, as we're recording this, this is the last week of 2020 that we'll be talking about. We traversed the BQE, mostly in Brooklyn, a little bit in Queens. A little bit in Queens, yeah, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, Brooklyn that's, to Queens. That's right, and we had the pleasure of welcoming Bahij Chansey onto our show this week. Bahij is a, a good friend. He is also a dedicated explorer of city planning and history. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he's really involved in city planning and city council meetings in transportation development, you know, alternative transportation, which is transportation other than single passenger cars. And we talk about that a little bit, which is funny because we're talking about the BQE, but Bihij also has a background in architecture and like we said, is uh, involved in city planning, is also studying to get his master's degree in city planning at the moment. That's right, at MIT. So yeah. very astute studier of all things cities. It was a pleasure and an honor to have him on. Yeah, it was really great. We learned a lot. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of architecture and urban planning opinion. And I hope that anyone listening learns as much as we did. Yeah. Yeah. So we're excited for you guys to listen to this. In addition to that, I have one caveat. Oh, what's that? Well, you know, there is a saying that's in film, but really it applies to many different fields mm -hmm. where you can have things cheap, good, and fast. Mm -hmm, you can have mm -hmm. two of those three. Mm -hmm. You can have things cheap and fast, sure, sure. good and cheap, et yeah. cetera, et cetera. Yeah, we get it. So there's a, a bit of a corollary to this one, the COVID corollary. Mm. I think you can uh, make a podcast recording that is COVID safe, uh -huh. that is warm, uh -huh. and that is noisy or noise free. Oh, and yeah. you can have two of those three. So uh, this episode, uh, we were in a COVID safe space on a porch. It was warm, mm -hmm. which is nice uh, for these winter months. We're going to be figuring that out. And it isn't terribly awful, but, you know, I'm the one editing it. The so, audio you're talking yes. about. We were recording in the shadow of the BQE at a uh, truck redistribution center. Car stuff. Yeah. And we were also, the the outdoor space is a concrete box. So there is all sorts of uh, mitigating factors there. But I think, honestly, because it's the BQE episode, it adds a little bit to the character of the recording. Well, I hope, I hope it feels like, to anyone listening and watching, it just feels like you're there with us. It's really a lovely space that we were in. I've spent many days out on that porch and... I had a wonderful time out there, so I hope that you just feel like you're right there with us. That's right. That was Jessie's apartment when we were first dating. It's true. You'll even see one of her weavings up there if you're watching oh, on the yeah, YouTube good episode. Call. Good call. Yeah. So, yeah. without further ado, I hope you enjoy. So, before we begin in earnest, I want to talk about uh, yesterday, because this is now the second day of our route walking the BQE, and. I was walking along the section where the uh, Naval Graveyard is, yeah. uh, down in the Williamsburg area. And uh, there is really a very small stretch there. I would say about three minutes worth of the entire 10-hour walk <laughs> when uh, the route, the BQE route, intersects with kind of the, the waterfront bike path right. there. So I went up in the Naval Yard uh, Graveyard because I've been there a bunch of times, just kind of spying it out only was there 10 seconds or so. And then I walk down and I'm walking along the path. And uh, as I'm walking along the path, this biker just stops abruptly next to me. Who could that have been? And as I, I, at first I thought it was just somebody to drop something. Like it didn't really occur to me much what was going on. And the person was like, hey, and I was like, uh, hey. And, I, and I'm just walking for like 10 or 15 seconds. And then the biker starts walking next to me. And he's like, uh, hey, Varley. I was like, oh shit, it's the <laughs> And, and it, it was so amazing because it was like you pulled up to me and you're like, I'm going to the kitchen. You want anything? Like it was <laughs> when, when meanwhile, like 
there was like it was like a Star Wars level of like precision that only you were only you were only on there for like thirty seconds. I'm only on for three minutes of te ten hours, and it just so happened to be that right at that time. You know, I noticed you walking from behind, and then I looked back and I saw you, and the only reason I recognized you was because of your highly Marley logo <laughs> on your hat, and I think you had one on your jacket too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally unexpected. I'm notorious for being very non-surprised when I see people in the street. Uh, yeah. People are like, hey, Bahij. I'm like, hey, what's up, baby? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally, man. I mean, yeah, I'm, uh, I have a reputation as a bit of a, a cool reactor, but you were like cold fusion, man. You were just <laughs> like, it, it, was, it was like you had just seen me yesterday or something. It was really funny. Um, but yeah, I mean, the odds of that happening were, were, were funny, but it was cool. It was good to see you and like, yeah. we got to talk a little bit about how this day was even going to, you know, be Unexpected. set up. Unexpected. You yeah. know, I was wondering, I went out on a ride yesterday just to have fun on a Sunday and I went out mostly east. Then I came back, I was kind of wondering if I would at any point intersect with you on your walk. Um, didn't think it would be there, yeah. honestly. Hmm. Um, yeah, but I had a nice long ride, and this was just toward the end that I saw you. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Were you riding on the Greenway the whole way? No, I, I rode first east out to um, Highland Park, and oh. then kind of over the hump into Queens, meandered around a bit, then came up Queens Boulevard and south once I got to Sunnyside. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's, a whole, that's a really big ride. Yeah, it's, a, it's about the average ride that I would like to do on a kind of a Sunday, mm. weekend day. Yeah. Well, there's so much uh, both Jesse and I have wanted to talk to you about. We've been excited to have you on. Uh, and this particular route makes sense for a bunch of reasons. Uh, you know, we are in the shadow of the BQE right now. You may be able to hear the din. We certainly can. We can see it from yeah. here. You'll be able to hear it on the video, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, we are, we are in Gowanus uh, right now. And uh, so there's, yeah, there's also just industrial truck traffic coming by. But um, yeah, I, I mean, in addition to all of that, which we'll get to, you know, you just mentioned the biking and we know you're, you know, well involved in bike advocacy. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I guess tell us a little bit about how you came into that advocacy role you know yeah sure um yeah i do a lot of bike advocacy around new york mostly with an organization called transportation alternatives um they're a big advocate for alternative transportation styles of many types primarily biking although lately they've been kind of making a stronger foray into advocacy for walking as well mm -hmm. um i got into that really after I came back to New York City from college. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in New York City um, and when I was going to high school every day I would take uh, the bus, the city bus, MTA bus mm -hmm. from my house down in Tribeca up to my high school in Chelsea. Mm -hmm. And my mom worked kind of near me and so we would take the bus together every day. <laughs> we could see it turn the corner so we would wait in our living room and watch for the bus turning the corner from the West Side Highway and as soon as it did we would run down to the bus stop. The bus driver knew we did that so he would wait if we oh. hadn't yet made it down. <laughs> um, and so we would took the bus up to Chelsea every day together. I got a little sick of riding the bus with my mom every day, right. as most high schoolers do, especially because there were other kids from my high school on the bus. Mm. Right. Uh, and so to avoid doing that, I started biking to high school. And I would bike up Hudson Street onto 8th Avenue. Um, I started doing that maybe late sophomore year, like going into junior, senior years. Uh, and in my senior year, the city under Transportation Commissioner Jeanette Sadek Khan started to install the first protected bike lanes yeah. um, wow. in New York City. I think they were the first protected bike lanes in the United States. Uh, and one of the first ones was installed on 9th Avenue, which was my route home. And then another early one was installed on 8th Avenue, which was on my route to school. So during high school, very early on, I kind of saw what a big difference it made to have really strong bike infrastructure mm -hmm. when you're riding. Um, of course, I didn't know anything about transportation alternatives or the fact that there were advocates and people calling for that to happen at the time. Um, I was pretty ob oblivious to that. I just thought as a high schooler, you know, great, the city is making improvements. Right. <laughs> um, and so I went to college. I studied architecture, so I was kind of very aware of, of things in the built environment. And I came back to New York City uh, and I started looking around for ways to get involved. I started first by going to uh, community board meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked a little bit about community board meetings earlier on our walk. Um, and then I figured out this organization, Transportation Alternatives, 
has a pretty active volunteer wing to the organization, which tries to get better bike infrastructure and everything in New York City. So from there, I started to go to their monthly meetings. I got involved in some of their campaigns. Uh, eventually, I had been going a few years, and I started to lead a few campaigns. Um, for a couple of years, I was um, the co-chair of the Brooklyn Activist Committee, um, which kind of coordinated a whole bunch of different walking and biking uh, safety campaigns around the borough of Brooklyn. Um, so I've done a lot of different things with TA. Uh, now I'm on the organization's board, so I kind of now have a more boring fiduciary duty, but uh, <laughs> still do get out and do some of the advocacy. How were your parents like with biking? I mean, you know, biking in the city is something that, you know, you have to be very responsible. Yeah. and uh, aware, especially because we haven't gone as far as we might like with the advocacy work. Yeah. Right. Were your parents, yeah. uh, you know, like trusting of you? Were they anxious? Like, where, where were they on that? Uh, definitely anxious. Definitely, yeah. you know, it's a scary thing at first to have your kid bike alone. I didn't start by biking to high school, though. On a, like, from middle school, me and my friends would bike around a lot just to get around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm because that was the way we could get around. Right. That was one of the nice things about growing up in the city is that like you can get around like that. You can get yeah. around on the subway. You have a lot of autonomy as a teenager. Um, and so we used to bike quite frequently between lower Manhattan and kind of Brooklyn Heights, Carroll Gardens area where some of my friends lived. And so they knew I was already kind of confident biking on the streets. So it wasn't totally terrifying when I started biking to high school. They were definitely um, made more confident when those protected lanes went in. Mm -hmm. It wasn't actually until probably senior year of high school that I started wearing a bike helmet. Oh, really? Um, my godmother was totally terrified of me biking in the streets, and she got right. it for me as my birthday present one year, and so yeah. I obligatorily Aww. started wearing the bike helmet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And now... Do you wear a helmet now? I do, yeah. Okay. Now, now I wear a helmet every time I go out. Yeah. Almost every time. Sometimes if I'm running a little errand, I might not yeah uh yeah but definitely for a long ride like i did um yesterday definitely wear a helmet sure yeah yeah it's not that comfortable for me and they really don't make helmets that fit well on curly hair uh, so you know that's a call to anybody who might be thinking about making those that would be great right yeah that's but, a great uh, business opportunity yeah yeah <laughs> do a when you join the organization i mean were you one of the younger people in the room um so I joined at the level of the activist committee, and yeah. I really wasn't, I was pretty kind of standard demographic for that uh, activist committee level in terms of age. Mm. It's a lot of younger people who tended to go to those meetings. There were some veterans, there were some middle-aged folks, some older seniors who'd been involved in the organization for a long time. TA's been around since the 70s. Um, and so there was some seniority in the room, but a lot of the folks who get involved at the activist level and are out doing and running the campaigns are pretty young people. Um, so when I joined there, uh, I was not abnormally young. I am abnormally young for the board. I think I'm the youngest person on the board. Um, but TA has recently shown a lot of initiative trying to diversify their board in terms of age, race, demographics. And so uh, they reached out an extension to to uh, invite me into the board and I was really happy to be able to join and kind of bring in a slightly different perspective than than a lot of the folks who have been on the board for in some cases a really long time. Yeah. What are some of the major things that have happened while you've been there? Or is there like is that a really hard question because it's broad or is the, is there it's something a broad you can question point but, that was like but really exciting? A lot of big things have happened while I've been working with TA. One of the ones I'm proud of and, and affects me more personally is the Fourth Avenue bike lane that goes that starts up at Atlantic Avenue and now goes all the way down to Bay Ridge. That was a, a huge thing that came about as a result of our advocacy. The protected bike lane on J Street was another campaign that we had really pushed for and came about as a result of our advocacy. Um, several of the north-south bike lanes and all of the cross-town protected bike lanes that went in in the last few years are TA or a products of TA advocacy. We can't wholly claim those things. Right. Of course, the city is involved in that and the city's transportation engineers and DOT are also very active in trying to make the streets safer for New York City. But TA has had a, at least a hand in pushing all of those the 14th Street busway that goes across the island, and now they're kind of exploring some other places to do busways like that. 
Queens Boulevard protected bike lane. There's a, there's been a lot. The yeah. city's been active in, in trying to expand the mileage of bike lanes in the city. It's amazing. I I mean, thank you for all of that. I <laughs> not, when not I me, but <laughs> well and and the whole organization. But um, when I first lived in Brooklyn, I had a bike and I would try to bike around, but it was such a terrifying experience for me, mm-hmm. to, especially on some of the more, the bigger streets. And now since COVID, I've started riding a bike again. There's also a city bike station near our house, yeah. um, which is new That's as of new, yeah. the end of 2019. So it was perfect timing. Very cool. And so on days when we're not walking, I sometimes ride the bike and I've noticed the yeah. paths that I used to take that like really turned me off of biking in the yeah. city are now fine good. and feel really safe. That's very good to hear. Yeah, yeah, and it's only been maybe, I don't know, I mean, within a decade, you know, within 10 yeah. years that I've noticed that major difference. You know, in my lifetime, which is not that long yet, I've seen a big change <laughs> in the way that New York City's streets are treated, although there's still a lot of horrible crashes that happen in New York and a lot of death. Um, the organization branched out and created a wing called Families for Safe Streets, which kind of brings together folks who have experienced um, crashes themselves or have had family members and friends killed from crashes. Mm. Uh, and that was really a foray into a whole new set of folks who've been negatively impacted by the way the streets are designed in New York City. And through that wing of the organization, some really big kind of citywide and systemic changes have happened. Like the speed limit was lowered to 25 miles an hour on every street in the city right. with few exceptions. And also the speed camera program that exists around New York City schools is a result of that work as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I feel like that, um, since you mentioned the poor quality of some of our streets, I feel like that's actually a really great segue into <laughs> talking about the BQE itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I may just no dive. Kidding right into it um you can fill in the gaps here i'm sure but i've really just started researching the bqe specifically for this week Mm -hmm. and of course having my own experience like driving on it and walking under it and living near it as well (laughs) but um i learned that uh robert moses was the person that built the bqe and is also the person that has built a lot of our infrastructure that is crumbling and it was this like long drawn out sort of like section by section Mm -hmm. project that just plowed right through all the neighborhoods except for brooklyn heights because they had an advocacy program um themselves and i guess uh I don't even know where to where to go from here, but since we talked about maybe we can like work our way backwards. Um, it looks like one thing I read was that within the next six years, that section over near Brooklyn Heights is going to fall apart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's go- in 2026, if I understand correctly, they're going to have to start divert- diverting truck traffic, mm. and then by 2036, it will start crumbling to fall apart. Yeah, to dust. Okay. So they need yeah. to figure out a plan. Yeah, that is of imminent importance right now. Um, The triple cantilever is what that section of the BQE is called under the promenade at Brooklyn Mm -hmm. Heights, which just from a traffic engineering perspective is is a really, I think, ingenious way of routing traffic, basically in a way that it is less disruptive of neighborhood residents. Mm -hmm. That said, it is only a result, as you mentioned, of the fact that there were that was a active neighborhood association. There were wealthy, well-connected residents in the area who were able to kind of get right in the city's face and make sure that a massive highway did not cut straight through their neighborhood. The majority of the other neighborhoods along the route um, were not so well endowed, so to speak, and uh, did not have that to their advantage. So the BQE really does cut straight through a lot of neighborhoods in New York City and creates a really harsh dividing line in a lot of places, along with other city highways and viaducts. It's funny when you mentioned the fact that Robert Moses had planned out the BQE yeah. um, and a lot of our crumbling infrastructure in New York <laughs> City. It's true. A lot of it is now crumbling. Uh, at the time, it was kind of brand new, shiny, beautiful things. It was part of the age of the car culture that everybody right. was kind of really enamored by at the time. Um, at the World Fair that happened in New York City in the 1930s, I can't remember exact year. It was 40 and 41. Thir- okay, thank you. Because I think you. I just read it this morning. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, 
there was an exhibit called City of the Future that mm -hmm. I think General, Mo General Motors put on. Okay. And it was this big kind of diorama that showed like how New York City might look if it had like beautifully routed highways all throughout the city. And oh this was gosh. kind of part of that whole vision of uh, a new type of city. And it was a city that was very divergent from the way everybody kind of experienced in new cities from the last, honestly, several thousand years where it's a compact thing, you can walk around, this is a new time and we've got this like new technology that can easily shuttle small groups of people from place to place. Uh, and so as a result, you had a, a whole generation of planners who grew up and were totally excited by this idea that we can get people around so-called efficiently through the use of these highways that cut through cities. Right. Yeah. I also read, just since you brought up the World's Fair, I read that one of the main, there were three reasons for the BQE. There was connecting the neighborhoods, you know, yeah. connecting the industry neighborhoods especially, so that people could get work done and that people from the different neighborhoods that were sort of underserved could get to places quicker. Yeah. Also getting to the bridges, the yes. Triborough was a big one. Um, and then also to get to the World's Fair faster. Yeah. That was a main reason. Mm -hmm. um, get to which, the airports too was a big part, yeah. Sure, that makes sense, yeah. But I, I just thought that like that they even considered like this thing that only happened two years. Right. Um, I guess happened again later, but like in that sort of time period, it's funny to me that that was a main, like it's almost like building a highway so that that one time that we have the Olympics in New York, people can make it there. Yeah, yeah. no, it's a, it's a good comparison, but it was an event that brought tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of tourists to New York City. Um, from all around the world, also from all around the country. And so it was very much in the mindset of people planning at the time. And remember how big of a spectacle those, oh those fairs were. It was like back then, yeah. huge grounds, you know, pavilions from countries all over the world. They were a big deal. I kind of, <laughs> as somebody who grew up outside the era of the World Fair, mm -hmm. There's all sorts of problematic things with events like World's Fairs and the Olympics, like you mentioned, but uh, I kind of wish I had seen the glamour of some of those. Yeah, sure. I definitely have a romanticized yeah. ideal about it if I kind of stay on the surface level. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So taking a step back uh, from that, um, you're currently studying urban planning. Yeah. Uh, back then, during the Robert Moses era, is historically, was there urban planning at that time? Like... I mean, they're doing things that with a new technology that they couldn't have possibly foreseen mm -hmm. from what, you know, like what the ramifications would be. And they're going, you know, with this full steam ahead approach, which is probably not the best way to do it. But like, were there, was there even a robust enough history of thinking about this type of thing that there could have been a better way at the time? Mm. Uh, that's that's a really interesting question because I think it could have multiple sort of different answers and different ways you might consider it. Uh, personally, I think that urban planning goes way, way, way back. Uh, even the Romans going to ancient history had really specific ways that they laid out cities along central axes that ran north, south, and east, west, and they kind of laid cities out around a grid based on that. Um, so it's been around for a very long time in different cultures, um, but there is a kind of a different way that modern planning has come up, and that's sort of what we're talking about now when we talk about this type of very kind of like highway-oriented transportation planner mindset that uh, we're, we're alluding to here. Um, so early 20th century, talking about the 20s, 30s, um, urban planning was very, very closely associated with architecture. And it was mm. often like architects who would be the so-called master planners, and there were often these big campus projects. Sometimes cities were completely planned out, like it's, it's pretty famous that Jefferson um, laid out the plan for DC and these huge arterial boulevards that mm. connect kind of diagonally across the city and, and create these sight lines um, around the National Mall in the center of DC. In Manhattan, of course, the way the grid is. Manhattan and the grid's layout. So that was that was done pretty early, and that was done, I'd say, toward the birth of when we consider uh, planning. The f often cited as the father of American urban planning uh, is Frederick Law Olmsted. Mm -hmm. um, Olmsted and Vox together designed Central Park. They designed Prospect, or I don't know if Vox was involved in Prospect he Park, was. but Olmsted definitely. We hit him up we uh, did a, a few walk weeks like ago. A nice. month ago. Yeah. <laughs> we had him on the podcast. You should check it out. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> Olmsted. Um, well known as a landscape architect, was also kind of sought after in his time as, as a city planner. And, yeah. mm. and he helped lay out a lot of 
cities around the United States, especially a lot of smaller cities. And uh, he grew up, or he um, worked in a time when a few different ideas around the way cities should be um, were starting to come up. Um, and this involved ideas like the City Beautiful movement. Um, this involved ideas like the Garden City movement. Mm. Uh, and a lot of these were planning brand new greenfield towns, so like towns built from the ground up, from grassy fields or woods, that were a little bit outside of these really heavily industrialized urban centers. So hmm. thinking about a city like London, where at the time, the main heating source in people's homes was still like coal-fired heating in a lot of places. Wow. So it was just filled with soot. It's hard, I think, for us to imagine now how totally black everything was Oof. because there was just soot wow. smoke everywhere. That's why they the all wear yeah. black in the photos Yeah, back in the day. Exactly. Oh my yeah. gosh, wow. Um, and so it was just a really dirty time. It was a yeah. really dirty time to be in cities and a lot of people were suffering from uh, lung diseases, from all sorts of problems right. having to do with public health, physical health, uh, from the way that cities were operating as these yeah. industrial, highly concentrated cores. At the time, there was this whole notion that light and air, um, at, with the contemporary um, theories about public health, were the cures to a lot of these ills that people right. were suffering from being in cities. And so the thought is we got to bring people out of cities and kind of get them into these suburbs. And this is like the beginning of when suburbs started to become a thing. Mm. Suburbs in the United States are really heavily connected with the like late 40s, 50s white flight mm -hmm. era mm -hmm. uh, after World War II. And that is very, uh, that coincides with this kind of mass um, automobile um, culture that mm. the freeways helped drive as they, as they connected people into cities. But the beginning of that suburban movement was earlier on toward the true heart of the Industrial Revolution era. And they started to, to bring people out of center cities more often on public transportation back then. So mm -hmm. there were kind of streetcars, trolley lines, trains that brought people in and out of center cities into these more lush, more green uh, garden cities and, and these places outside of those. And so that's Olmsted's era and that is the era when planning and kind of, yeah, really building out and, and literally planning on a piece of paper the way the city was gonna be started to be a more important profession. Mm. Like I said, it started with architects, but as you get toward the mid part of the 20th century planners and the idea of city planning started to kind of diverge uh, from uh, the conception of architecture. And so yeah. it wasn't just architects then who had the right to design physical space, so to speak. It was planners as well who started to come up as their own profession. The first uh, city planning departments in universities really didn't come around until that early part of the 20th century. You mm. wouldn't have found city planning degrees or programs like that where you would have found people studying architecture, but you wouldn't have found city planning programs mm. until I think the 20s or the 30s in the United States. Okay, so was Robert Moses actually trained as a planner? Uh, Robert Moses was trained like me at Yale Architecture School, so. Oh. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. 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 so he, um, yeah, he was, a pr he was a trained architect. Um, however, he, as far as I know, uh, if I'm remembering the power broker correctly, he never actually practiced architecture. Oh, okay. Um, he came out of school, he came back to New York City where Robert Moses was from. He was a New York native uh, as well. And he started to look really closely at the bureaucracy of the city and mm. the way things were run. At that time, it was under Tammany Hall. Um, and there was a lot of corruption, <laughs> needless to say, under Tammany Hall, which is now what right. it's synonymous with, right? right. Um, and he started working at these good government organizations that would kind of be watchdogs of the city government and say, okay, why are we spending 10 times what we thought we were going to on this courthouse? And so he started to look at, uh, in these good government organizations and as, as much as I know, Robert Moses's particular fascination was, was literally in the bureaucracy and mm. how the city is choosing who to employ, where to employ them, how it's delegating the different levels of employment within the city agencies. Huh. Uh, and he wrote up, a, I think his dissertation, I think he went to Oxford, I think his dissertation was about, was basically a plan recommending how New York City ought to structure its bureaucracy and how to place people where in the city government. Oh wow, interesting. And then he basically just took on every role of 
leadership exactly. in the city. <laughs> yeah, so over his tenure, he, he came to lead many different departments in the city and the state. Yeah. Wow. Which is interesting to, I mean, it's interesting on so many different levels, but to, I always find the personalities within history that operate on a level that isn't traditional to be so interesting, you mm -hmm. know, where it's like, I can really, I know what my personal strengths are, and I also can see where the threads of power are, mm -hmm. and I don't need to be the mayor. Yeah. You know, like oh, I, yeah. I just I just need to pull the strings that I need to pull in order to see my vision come to fruition. You know? yeah. yeah, it seemed like and this I guess this is actually the question I really wanted to ask what your opinion was, um, which I'll get to in a second. But it seems to me like he really did just like pull the string like really fast, kind of in a lot of different directions. And he seems like a very complicated figure to me because um, even just with the BQE in particular, you know, it like just kind of steamrolls right through so many different neighborhoods and um, how Brooklyn Heights was able to advocate for themselves because they were wealthier. And they also got that promenade put on top, which they wanted to be private. They wanted just yeah. to be for them. And then Robert Moses was like, no, 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 like this has to be public. So he seems to be like really interested in helping people and helping the public and making things better for everyone mm -hmm. and then at the same time seems to just do things that like now with so much hindsight I can see are not great for especially yeah. disadvantaged people so yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm curious just since you know more about him if you have like personal opinion on yeah. how he worked you know, Robert Moses is a really complicated figure uh, and a lot of mixed reactions. You bring up Robert Moses' name and some people totally hate him. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I have a more mixed opinion about Robert Moses. I think he did a lot of really terrible things in New York City, but I think he also did a lot of really important, really good things for New York City. Um, so you mentioned him wanting to make the promenade public. We have Robert Moses to thank for it's like some crazy amount, like 40% or something of the, of the community parks, the pocket parks, the little parks that exist around New York mm -hmm. City. Wow. Um, because extending from that mindset that we talked about where access to light and air was so important, he really did believe that people ought to have space to play, mm -hmm. that kids needed to have places to play. So part of his prerogative was to try to plan parks in every part of the city hmm. and not just these huge parks like Pelham Bay Park for instance which um, he's associated with with having created but all these little parks that are easy to get to throughout neighborhoods um, that said he wasn't entirely benevolent um, Robert Moses is pretty notoriously known for being a racist mm. essentially that he did not like certain people really looked down upon poor people in particular um, and so the way that highways were taken as a tool to re really run through neighborhoods, that was done strategically and, and with certain neighborhoods in mind. Mm -hmm. um, so the Federal Highway Act uh, of the 1960s gave cities a lot of power um, and really gave states a lot of power in order to control funds that were coming from the federal government to build what was seen as a, a utility, a new necessity. We needed to have highways that were going to be able to move lots and lots of cars because this was the way of the future. Um, and in doing so, the way that you could plan where highways were allowed to go through a city uh, was connected to um, this idea about blight, urban blight. Mm where poor neighborhoods, at that time typically tenement neighborhoods, um, most often neighborhoods that housed minorities, at that time it was almost a more expansive idea of who a minority was. Mm -hmm. You remember Italians, Irish, everybody, right. kind of, anybody who wasn't white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant was considered a minority at that time, but still, I mean, as were black people, as were the contemporary idea of minority peoples. Right. Uh, and so all of these people's neighborhoods that were in many cases thriving, sometimes they were down on their luck, poorer neighborhoods, but in many cases they were communities that were built up and had retail, business, residential, a whole mix of things. They were seen as too messy. They were seen mm. as, as being not the ideal of how a city should be. 
And at that time, we're, we're also talking about a time when planners wanted to control things. 1916 is when zoning came into effect in, in, in New York City in particular. New York City was a pioneer in trying to zone separate land uses to say, the city is too crazy like this. There's too much stuff going on. And, and in order zoning, the idea it comes legally from protecting uh, this public health, moral, safety, and welfare. So oh, these, wow. are the, these are the four kind of tenets on which every zoning law is enacted. I think only one of those is objective. I think right. the three right. of them right. are right. subjective. Yeah. yeah. And Health. so I and think that's yeah. about it. That and that's literally the uh, the the text that's in what are called zoning enabling acts that are often written into law at the state level which gives cities the power to create land use uh, yeah. zoning laws. Mm -hmm. And when there's challenges against zoning, uh, it's against those four tenets that the zoning laws are compared to say okay, does this zoning law legitimately advance the interests of public morals or public welfare right. or health? Oh my gosh. And so this was a time when they're really trying to control cities and make them make sense logically, make them ordered, reasonable. Uh, and so these neighborhoods that were what we might see as thriving now or what many might have seen then as thriving uh, were seen as disorderly and crazy places and wow. places breeding disease or places breeding poverty. Poverty mm -hmm. then was also very much seen as a disease. Right. Uh, and they were labeled blight. And wow. so, and this was an actual de designation city planners would use at the time. They would say this area of the city is a blighted area. It has a lot of um, overlap with the areas that were, con that were redlined areas mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was through these blighted areas that the city uh, would use pa its really, really um, powerful um, mechanism of eminent domain to take people's properties, um, reimburse them some, some amount because it's illegal to do so without just compensation, so mm -hmm. to speak. That compensation and the amount that was given out by the cities is highly debated. Right. Um, but they were, people's properties were taken whole swaths of areas, whole wow. like blocks and blocks and blocks, if you can imagine, were just demolished, yeah. just flattened down to yeah. the ground. And there were these huge swaths of areas, not just in New York City, but in cities around the United States that were destroyed under this, under, um, this program of, of uh, destroying, demolishing blighted areas, and then building, honestly, highways that right. would run through cities, run into cities, because it was seen as such a necessity at the time. Yeah. Right. As opposed to sort of like building the highway, for example, in Red Hook, because this is where, right where we are, yeah. the highway runs right through and it fully disconnects. Like, yeah. you vote on the other side of the BQE, right? That's where I voted yeah. when I lived here. And they've since and changed my voting site, but yes, oh, they have? the okay. Mickey Center was where we would go to vote. And yeah, but it would you have take, to like, you have to cross thing. this huge thing. And like, I saw a possum on my way to vote one time. <laughs> <laughs> like, it yeah. was like you're going into a whole other world. Yeah, and yeah. so it's like, if for people that live over there, they're completely disconnected, as opposed to just like, the water is right there too. It could just extend the highway out to where Ikea is now mm -hmm. instead of sort of cutting right through and that could have all just been a neighborhood. Although I was thinking now with the way that the waterfront's being revitalized, I almost am glad that that didn't happen because sure. then that wouldn't be a thing that we would have a connection to. I mean, there's no real good answer to like how this yeah. could have happened. Yeah. But I mean, circling back to what I had asked earlier, I mean, it, it seems like there was definitely an idea of urban planning, but for lack of um, a term that doesn't exist that's better yet, Jesse and I have been talking about this, the idea of like masculine, feminine, mm -hmm. or like creative nurturing, if we're going to use it, some type of dichotomy here, it doesn't really seem like there was a lot of nurturing energy around. It was more like, we want to have this amazing paper design, we want to forward this great new creation that's a car, and we're not really going to reflect on who we are as creators to see what our blind spots are. Mm. We're just going to assume that all of our internal mechanisms that are making up this plan are correct and move forward with it and put this paper thing into place. And, and yeah, I don't know if there was ever this, except for areas like Brooklyn Heights, which is, again is problematic in its own right. Yeah, we want to make this park that's private. And it's like, you right. know, they, they push back. But as far as like a reflection on what this this these things will mean it seems like that we've come a long way in that respect we have uh, and I would credit planners 
modern day planners as being far more uh, reflective on, on the practice of planning and what planning actually is uh, in terms of bringing in uh, the voices of the communities where they're doing planning work, right. uh, in terms of really thinking about their positionality of who they are, as you mentioned. Yeah. At that time, that was not thought of. And yeah. it was primarily done by white, mostly straight, not, I mean, that was probably the, the one deviation that there was more of, but pr mostly white men. Yeah. yeah. Um, and at the time, there was very little uh, reflection on, on what it meant for communities uh, where people were planning. Um, the other thing about it is that yeah, there's no good place to put a highway. Just to, yeah. to go back to your point for, no, yeah, for, sure. for one sec. I, I'm not a huge <laughs> fan of, of highways that exist uh, within cities. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, people were not thinking. I mean, yeah, but at the same sorry, time, my what mind is a little bit around, but yeah, yeah, um, yeah no, it's great. There was, so you say there wasn't really a, a nurturing element to planning at the time, which I would agree with, but at the same time, it was a very these planners were often doing city planning because they believed that their ideas were what was best for society and would result in a healthier society right. or in a right. uh, more civically engaged society, this, that, or the other. But it was yeah. a very paternalistic way of right. doing mm -hmm. it. Yeah, which is why I, I caveat the idea that yeah. like this masculine, feminine, creative nurturing, they're incomplete terms. Mm -hmm. I haven't really found what I, the exact thing is because there, exactly, the idea of paternal nurturing yes. is a type, yeah. but it's it's yeah this pure like I know what is right and yes. we're gonna make this happen based on that. Yeah. And honestly, no matter what, like you said, yeah, if it had gone along the water, then we'd have other complaints. Like yeah. putting a highway in a city is a tricky thing to do, mm -hmm. and if we didn't have the BQE, we'd also have a lot of complaints yes. because there's a lot. There is truly a lot of traffic. It sounds like there was then, definitely more now. Like. Yeah. Getting from here to Williamsburg in 13 minutes mm -hmm. versus going on all the back roads and all the local roads would take 35 minutes at least. That's on a traffic free BQE, which, if you know, the BQE <laughs> is pretty rare. It's at like 2 in the morning <laughs> on a Monday. I love my casual 4 30 a.m. Yeah. drives. What has <laughs> since been realized by traffic planners, though, uh, with highways now in existence and us able to do these empirical studies where we can <laughs> look at traffic, right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, the theory of induced demand is, is, is really an important concept in, in transportation planning now where mm -hmm. um, they used to say, and in some cities they still do say, like in Houston when they say, oh man, there's too much congestion on this road, let's make it three lanes wider. We now realize when you make the road wider, more people end up driving. Right. The the better access and the quicker you enable a transportation method to get somewhere, the more people are going to use it. If you build really good trains, people are going to use it. If you build really good roads, people are going to use it. Right. If you widen the roads, more people are going to come, and typically travel times don't get that much better. Right. Is that uh, how much of that is based also on the idea that? a road above ground is kind of 2D, but like tunnels are potentially 3D. Like you, could you potentially build tunnels on top of tunnels to like make it so that possibly there'd be more vehicles? We just watched an interview with Elon Musk, which is where he's yeah, getting that's what that he's, that's what he's pitching. Ground. So I'm trying, I'm not, I'm not pitching Elon's idea. Yeah. I'm curious if that's just something that he's saying, you know, versus um, actually something that is closer to an objective, you know. You know, I don't know the academic uh, work on this so far, but I would assume that there, the theory of induced demand would still apply, especially in the situation of a tunnel where you can only build tunnels so fast and you can only kind of connect new routes so quickly. And as those get built up, they will too start to fill up with the people who you're attracting to use them because right. they're the quickest way through. Right. Um, some transportation some transportation planners, excuse me, turn to the idea of flying cars, right? If you're going up in three dimensions, right, right then we start to escape some of the problems of congestion that we now see in cities. Um, I'm really not hopeful on that yeah. as a solution for, for the future of transportation planning. Which he brought sounds up as messy. well, actually, and he was like, if you can imagine yeah. what a drone sounds like, yeah. imagine a car. <laughs> yeah. no, and then again, it's thing. just that everyone's in their own individual Exactly, that's the thing, true problem. Trying to go right. in different directions and like... Yeah, I mean, I think the future of transportation planning, in my personal opinion, has to be in mass transit. Single occupancy vehicles or vehicles that carry only a small pot of people. 
while they might be attractive in the time of a pandemic, as we are now, yeah. um, they've got a lot of problems when it comes to logistics of moving people around that you kind of start to escape when you get larger, defined routes. Right. I have one question that isn't uh, specifically related to the BQE, but is related to kind of what we're talking about right now. Yeah. Um, we all know in this room here right now, I'm sure we all know about how Robert Moses also wanted to build a highway through uh, the village, yes. right? And then Jane Jacobs was very yeah. much instrumental in stopping that. And I wonder, the thing I don't know is what did they do? Because somehow... It works, right? Like, What did they do to stop it? Or no, what did they do instead? Like, what did they do? He was like, we need this highway. We need this highway. We don't have a highway in the village. We certainly don't have something that looks like the BQE in Greenwich Village right now. So, like, is it the West Side Highway that came instead? Or, or like, is it just mass transit that worked out? Um, a little bit of neither, actually. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I no, no highway was built through the village. And because of almost the opposite of induced demand, you can see it was not necessary in the end. We did not get a circumstance where huge trucks are trying to barrel through the village because mm -hmm. it's just not a viable option for trucks and for passenger cars at a smaller scale to do mm -hmm. so. Um, my, my theory, and I think it's backed up by some of the academic literature in this respect, is that when we don't build these huge highways running through cities, there are fewer people who choose to drive and there is just a reduction in mm. the amount of traffic that needs to be handled, so to speak, okay. by local streets. Um, so the West Side Highway, in the case uh, that you're speaking about, was already planned or had maybe already been built. I'm not sure exactly okay. on the timeline here. But the West Side Highway used to be an elevated highway, too. To your earlier point about oh. access to the water, that, that it completely cut the water off yeah. from most of Manhattan. And at the time, um, the west side of Manhattan was industrial docks. They were docks that were com primarily commercial industrial purposes and completely the opposite of what we now think of when we think of the west side highway and we think of the Hudson River Park. Yeah. We, th we think of this beautiful, easily, pretty easily accessible mm -hmm. route along the water, this greenway. That was not at all the concept of how the city should meet the water's edge at the mm -hmm. time. And it wasn't really until we destroyed the viaduct that was the West Side Highway, at least up till 72nd Street. Right. Or I suppose 59th Street. Um, that we really started to reconceive of how Manhattanites in particular should start to connect to the water and that this mm -hmm. could be recreational space, that this could be a park yeah. space, that this should be, that it's a city that should have a sort of human level connection to the water yeah. and yeah. not just through industry. And, and you mentioned, you know, where it still remains adjacent to the park, you know, as we have a truck outside right now, we've done recordings on that stretch mm -hmm. and like uh, we'll be doing our one of our use of force recordings. And then it's just like we have to stop because yeah. it, it's so loud. And you I mean, it, there's so much that you can just kind of conceptualize on paper where it's just like, well, there'll be a park and then there'll be a highway next to it and whatever. It can just coexist. And yeah. like then you actually get into a sonic landscape like that and you're like, yeah, I'm not going to yell on this because then, no. but, but you know, it, it becomes inherently less attractive, even yes. if visually everything is fine. Even if you can like put up a hedge wall or something like it no longer becomes a space that people want to habitate. You know? Right. And I guess that's all, this is all just stuff that, yeah, like you were saying at that time when these were all starting to be built, this was a new concept and like yeah. those, you didn't have any lived experience to reference. And now planners have lived experience and I'm sure there's things that we're doing now that are gonna in 70 years people are gonna be like what why did why did they do yeah, that TikTok. why did they build that yeah. like TikTok. <laughs> I saw yeah. um, that there's a because that part of the BQE that cantilevered part is being re or needs to be rebuilt I saw some plans that were being suggested and one of them had this like which is just to me I'm I'm laughing because it's just like that neighborhood still is like so wealthy posh, and yeah. posh yeah and like yeah. they already have the park they already have yes. like all this stuff and they're suggesting that just in that area just for bbp they cover it with this like strange like 
angular dome, mm -hmm. like a sound barrier that's like just covers that entire area yeah. and like no other part. Just there. There's a certain special uh, <laughs> treatment and deference that gets paid to that area, uh, in part because of its wealth and its connections. But, so in this plan to try to reconstruct the triple cantilever, there have been various schemes that they've been entertaining to try to figure out, what do we do? What do we do with the traffic here? Yeah. Um, and a few of them have been tunneling schemes. Mm. Right. Yeah, that I there would be that. new tunnels built that would, I can't remember the exact and, and, and starting points of these tunnels, but basically that they would reroute the traffic, drive the BQE underground for some mm. stretch of, in some cases, of several miles, and then it comes back up to join around the Gowanus Expressway. Okay. Um, that's an, an, an immensely difficult thing to do in New York City. There's a yeah. lot of things that are already underground in New York City. Right. Uh, and so the fact that they're even entertaining such a challenging and expensive method is, is, is testament to how much people feel we need to maintain these highways. Mm. I will say that there is a whole group of advocates in New York City who, seeing the, the BQE is, is literally falling apart, that it's nearing the end of its useful and, and safe life, that we should not re replace it, and we should not fix it, that we should really just get rid of the BQE. Oh, wow. That we should return the streets that run under the BQE to be neighborhood streets that we might repurpose the BQE's structure for something else as for instance the High Line has been repurposed in mm -hmm. Chelsea not to say that it needs to be a park or a linear thing like that but just conceiving of a city of Brooklyn of Queens of different parts of the five boroughs without urban highways that run through the, the heart of the city. Right. Um, it's something that people are starting to do more so now, and there's, I would, I would say that there was a growing uh, call for this to really be a, serious, a seriously considered option. I think, you know, it's really interesting. I wonder if anyone that listens to this, I hope people have a similar feeling that I'm having right now. I've never once considered that that would even be a possibility but what you just explained with this um i forget the terms you used but induced traffic induced demand yeah. induced demand and the opposite it seems like the perfect solution i mean your example of the village is the perfect solution we go through the village now and we're not like oh man there should be a highway <laughs> here like there's way too much traffic no <laughs> and when even when i drive into the city i'm yeah. just like i just expect it i'm like i yeah. know if i'm trying to get out of the city i can go down canal street there might be a backup but that's yes. the only street i go down if i'm gonna try to drive into the east village or something like I'm just going to, that's going to be an all day affair, and yes. that's all it is. You're being very casual about the <laughs> level of traffic that you need to encounter when yes. leaving the city on a weekend in the summer. It's horrifying. It's in the summer on, that's true. We, we did actually have an experience last week. On the way to Michigan last year, oh, you, yeah. you flew out, right? But um, no, we drove no, out you too. You drove actually. out, but you flew back. That was yeah. it. Um, yeah, we had like stuck in traffic for like five hours or something. Yeah. It's no, real. It yeah, can it's be, real. It, it can, can be, be real. But if you leave at the right time, I don't know. It's also just, it's like going to the post office. You know you're going to be in line for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I certainly would not like to see any new highways created, but I, I don't quite know where I would need to do like more research as to where I would lie with what to do next. Yeah. It does seem to me like maybe by 50 to 70 years and see where we stand then. Because I would be concerned about how things get into and out of the city less mm -hmm. than how people move around the city. Yes. But, you know, again, that's where I would need to do more research. If, like, if we can do it all through, like, trains, you know, get everything in that way. Or just make sure that more of the production that's necessary already exists in the city, then maybe that's what it is. Mm -hmm. But, you know, once you remove that... It's never coming back. That's true. There and is a lot of truck traffic true. on the BQE yeah. too. <laughs> like right goes. now, I can see three tractor trailers. I think. So right now, the BQE <laughs> connects roads that's that come into the city from the south and also extend north. So some people are taking the BQE to continue off mm. into Connecticut. Some of that can be sort of routed around the city on some of the existing highways. But in terms of bringing things literally into the city, which is where so many things need to come, right? This is where people live. And so they need to get a lot, a lot of stuff into the city. Logistics need to be thought of in a totally different way if right. we're going to uh, remove 
highways that run into cities. Uh, and you're going to have to start to do logistics where, for instance, we have a tractor trailer truck parked right outside that keeps making noise because <laughs> we have a redistribution center right here. And they take these huge tractor trailer trucks and they, all this company does right next to us is they take the stuff off of those trucks and then they put them onto small trucks that then drive around the streets of the city. Right. It's actually illegal for these, for trucks that are longer than 52 feet, which is what these tractor trailers are, to drive around local streets in New York City mm. unless they're on certain designated truck routes, right? Right. So you start to have regulations and you start to have a logistics system that differs where such a tractor trailer would have to park in a redistribution center off a highway, mm. um, probably in New Jersey, in a space north of the city, uh, and it's there that things get redistributed to smaller vehicles and those are the things that then take those goods into and out of the city. Right. And what do those neighborhoods look like? Yeah, if all exactly. of a sudden there are trucks that are just parking there and yeah. getting, you know, moving goods around. Right, yeah. and I guess that's actually kind of like a classic, um, probably more than New York City, but a New York City issue that I'm aware of where we take our problems and we say, yours now. Yes, yeah, <laughs> it happens. It happens in cities everywhere. And it's interesting, right now we're sitting in Gowanus, which is part of it, an industrial business zone. Mm -hmm. So some of it is, is is in the zoning code really strictly said okay this is going to remain industrial forever right uh, and a lot of that politically was an effort to maintain the jobs that exist in right. industrial sure. areas because right. there have been so many industrial workers who have been forced out of their roles because in a in a very high land value city uh, in a place where there is a nexus on land and that drives up real estate prices it's forced out industries that are not super high productive and I'm not talking right. about productive producing things I'm talking about economically productive like mm -hmm. the financial industry or things that just generate a lot of capital right and so these businesses that have employed industrial workers and and those are a lot of the jobs that exist for um, people who haven't got college degrees but who are kind of uh, high school educated workers and other people like that or vocationally skilled workers a lot of those jobs have left the city because yeah. we forced them out because like we just don't allow for for such a such a land use to exist here. Yeah, and I that particular thing I'm definitely in favor of keeping. Like yeah. I think it's really important. We were talking before we got on camera about this a little bit. I think it's really important that people can have work and that we don't just become sort of like a tech giant. Yeah. Uh, I think that's part of the the beauty of this city that there is that diversity in like every possible way you could think of the word diversity it's mm -hmm. and that includes having industrial iron workers and and production that things should be made here yeah yeah i totally agree but that said i don't think we need those tractor trailers in order to make that happen yeah 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 i think we can do it in different ways and i think we can get creative about the ways that we do it as has been shown in, in places, and it can be done. Yeah. 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 You know, moving slightly from the logistics and practicalities of what the road is, the aesthetics themselves, you know, mm -hmm. all of us to some experience have uh, been involved uh, with both the, the underpasses, the overpasses, and the promenade, you can literally walk on top of the road yeah. as it, because of the cantilever yeah. system. Yeah. You know, it, I, I think that, like you were talking about the World's Fair earlier, you know, romantically kind of wish, you know, it's problematic, but I wish it was there. I wonder if in some ways people in the future will think the same if we end up getting rid of the Bikui like that. Because you also mm -hmm. think about the aesthetic <laughs> of uh, like the Barclays Center, right? Yes. And you think, the, you know, that, that Brooklyn rust? Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe there's an actual official name for that. Mm -hmm. But you know that idea where it's like, oh, it's weathered iron. Like, that's probably because of the BQE and systems like huh. that where it's like that that is a signature of this borough is these, yeah. you know, degrading iron oxidized, <laughs> you know, pillars. Yeah. That's true. And it is beautiful. Yes. I mean, from a purely aesthetic point of view. And then the other thing that's so beautiful about the BQE that I think everyone has experienced at some point, again, that cantilevered section, mm -hmm. driving that at night. And mm -hmm. seeing the city, right, seeing the it skyline. doesn't matter, I think, how long you've lived here or how jaded you get. Like, 
that little moment is like the moment in every movie when you're getting off the plane for the first time in New York City and like it's so beautiful yeah and it's disgusting also because it's like the trucks and the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right it, on the wall and you're also like oh right. no I really need to pay attention because this road is like such a quick turn and like we should not be going this fast <laughs> this is like yeah and the lanes are too thin but like I want to look you know <laughs> It makes me question why such a beautiful view is really reserved for people driving their cars through the BQE. I've it's actually, true. when I first moved into this yeah. apartment, I had friends visit from back home in Pennsylvania, yeah. and I would take us in a taxi to Williamsburg yeah. just, just to show them that, that view. <laughs> and then we'd like go do something, but like, I would be like, no, we have to take a car just so you can see the yeah. city from that point of view. Yeah. Well, my version of that is taking people to walk on the promenade. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But yeah. that same view that we're going to go see. So that the Corten steel that, that clads the Barclays Center and that kind of patinated metal aesthetic, yeah, you're right, is, is kind of a nostalgic thing that we look for in the industrial or post-industrial Brooklyn, whatever we want to call it. And I think you're right. If we got rid of the highways... Just as whenever anything leaves cities, or not even cities, whenever anything leaves a city, a town, there is always an air uh, of nostalgia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me take one second. Who would miss that? Yeah, right. Yeah, they're leaving. <laughs> so there's always going to be some nostalgia when things change in cities. Right. Uh, and, you know good thing bad thing i don't have an opinion either way on that but i think that like no matter what it is even if at the time it's seen as a horrible thing yeah like there's nostalgia about like tenement buildings in new york city totally. and the, and the yeah. form of building they are at the time nobody was nostalgic about tenement you did not want to live in a tenement building like right. that was not a good place to be or a nice way to lay out cities yeah to yeah. jam 15 people in a room but like yeah. now we're like oh like the romantic lower east side right. with its push carts and so there's always going to be nostalgia around anything that changes in cities. Um, I don't necessarily think that's a reason for us to say, oh, we shouldn't change it now. Sure. No. Yeah. And yeah. I think that that actually is probably, we'll have to get some psychologist on or something because I think the way we remember things, there must just be like some self-preservation of like <laughs> mental health in the way that yeah. we remember things and talk about things so that we're not just always like, we, we do tend to think about take things from like a positive yeah looking back on things yeah you see yeah. you see the good yeah so yeah i think moving forward we need to try and actually make it good not just like <laughs> or just preserve the aesthetics you know. of it you know and build around it what well, like the high line and right. there was another mm -hmm. organization that you mentioned while we were walking yeah. earlier uh, can you talk a little bit about that yeah so the design trust for public space is an organization that does work all around new york city not just having to do with elevated highways uh around all sorts of the uh, things in the built environment and the way we experience public space in particular. A few years ago, they published a report called Under the L, mm -hmm. which looked at the sort of lost space, so this kind of like no man's space that exists under all the viaducts, under all the elevated highways, the elevated train lines all around New York City. Uh, a lot of that space is not so well conceived of it's used for unsanctioned uses it's not used it sits empty and so the aim of that report was to kind of reimagine how we might bring those spaces into use make them welcoming spaces in some ways through programming through lighting through materiality um, but like you're saying from here in Gowanus to get over to Red Hook crossing Hamilton Avenue under the Gowanus Expressway, part of the BQE, is like, like a harrowing experience. Yeah. <laughs> you, have to, you have to cross four lanes of traffic, only going in one direction, and then you get to this beat up, concrete, like sandy, gravelly median that has no care or anything put into it, and it's completely in disrepair. And then you cross another four <laughs> lanes of traffic, and then you get to Red Hook. It's like that yeah. completely, completely cuts areas off from one another, and, and just because I've done a lot of focus in my career around public housing, I'll just mention the places where well, oftentimes Robert Moses would plan where to put public housing, we, we put them in these undesirable areas that are cut off from the rest of the city. So right. the Red Hook Houses, which is the largest housing complex in Bro public housing complex in Brooklyn, is in Red Hook. Right. And it's completely cut off from public transit lines, which exist on this side of the BQE. And in order to get anywhere to go to work, 
people from Red Hook houses have to either walk across or take the bus. Right. Uh, and, you know, they don't have direct access to things. So. And that amazing experience that you had growing up in Tribeca where you were a kid and you could bike and you could take public transportation. Yeah. And as a young person, you could, like, get around so easily. The young people living in Red Hook probably can't. I mean, I lived on a two-lane road that was sort of busy, and my mom wouldn't let me cross the street mm -hmm. alone until I was, like, 14. Yes. So I imagine kids that are growing up over in Red Hook are probably not, I would think, not allowed to just cross Hamilton Boulevard on their own until they're older, too. That may be the case. I mean, I grew up in, an, in, a, in a wealthy area with a lot of privilege, and I grew up in an area where a lot of train lines converged. There was just a lot of access I had yeah. to a lot of different parts of the city, both on foot, because it's a walkable area in that lower part of Manhattan, on bike for the same reason, uh, and then also by train. I could easily get around the city by the different train lines that yeah. come down to Tribeca. Which is the That doesn't for exist most... for a lot of people. Right, yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, for most people in New York, there's some access like that, but then yeah, there are these, these not that quite that well yeah. access, but um, then there are these areas that are just like completely separated. And I'm glad yeah. you brought that up because when I asked you earlier about your thoughts on Robert Moses, that was in my head yeah. too, but I didn't quite get it out. Yeah, so I, part of my career has been working training uh, young adults for, for jobs um, and uh, we would train people who um, lived in New York City public housing, so NYCHA developments all around the city. Um, and so just in speaking to many of the young adults that we trained, it was shocking to me. This was a, a huge surprise to me, was how many young people grew up in neighborhoods and never left their neighborhoods. Oh, wow. Really, their their whole life, their whole community revolved around their one neighborhood. Mm. And even though they grew up in New York City, like the one of the most cultured, beautiful cities in the world with so many different things to do, so many activities, their experience of New York City was not necessarily that of all of this, these many things it has to offer, but really the experience of, of their neighborhood and, mm. and, and not having ventured much outside of it. Uh, that was not always the case by any means. Many people who I worked with had traveled and knew many and all sorts of different parts of the city, but I was shocked by how many young people who we worked with um, really did not leave their neighborhoods, wow. either because of sort of mental barriers that existed, mm -hmm. logistic barriers of there not being transportation options available to them, uh, or in some cases, uh, sort of family restrictions, like you're saying, like your parents wouldn't necessarily want you to venture out because it's not perceived as being safe to do so. Right. And if they are in an area where it's cut off by a four lane yeah, exactly. or eight lanes of traffic, you, yeah. you know, as you're describing, I mean, in that way, is it's, it, the vision of Robert Moses was insidiously effective. It, it really, yeah. it really mm -hmm. partitioned people into like groups and it's, yeah. you know, I guess the, the best we can do now at this point is kind of think about how that was effective and figure out a way to like reverse it to make it yeah. just as effective in a positive way, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to mm -hmm. actively work against it. One of the most famous anecdotes about Robert Moses and his racism is the, the beaches that are planned on the southern part of Long Island, uh -huh. like Jones Beach, for instance, which is one of the things Robert Moses planned. There's expressways that lead out to Jones Beach, very accessible for people driving who, who have a car. Um, apparently, Robert Moses planned the overpasses on those expressways too low for public buses to be able to run right. under them to yeah. prevent people who use public transit from getting out to those beaches. Wow. This is an anecdote. I can't speak to its validity, but... That is one thing often cited about Robert Moses' uh, wow. kind of disdain for, for the working poor classes. Yeah. You know? is it, I, I mean, maybe you're familiar with it, or maybe somebody else is that's listening, but I, I would be really interested if there was anybody that kind of spoke with him at length about this. You mm -hmm. know, if you're just treating it as a philosophy and not just kind of like bigotry. Like, where, where is it coming mm -hmm. from in his head that, you know, that that was how things were planned, you know? Mm -hmm. It should be planned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and uh, it, I mean, it, it is, you know, we exist in a world where it feels like we're not moving fast enough, but like to even be at a point where we're like, that's bizarre. Like, you know, yeah. like we can't tolerate that, you know, I as like normal and, like, behavior. I can't imagine that ever happened. Like 
that would get pointed out so many times by so many people now i would think i mean i'm sure there's still people that think that way unfortunately but yeah yeah. it's amazing the opaque processes through which planning decisions like transportation planning and everything happen i I served on the community board of of this area community board six in brooklyn for Mm -hmm. several years on the transportation committee and that is the public forum where the public is supposed to go and see what's coming up from the city and they say oh we're gonna do this lane change we're gonna put a bike lane in here we're gonna change where this bus stop is something like that that goes to the community board the community says oh okay yeah we agree with that that makes sense in reality the community was you know the 15 of us who showed up to that meeting because we had volunteered to come every single month right. and it's a public meeting anyone can come come in it's it's open it's advertised poorly um, but the folks who come out and actually monitor or oversee what the city is doing mm-hmm. uh, it's a it's a small slice of folks yeah that's um, I'll just put in a plug for for local journalism and the importance of, of things like DNA info which went out of business which did really really important local reporting yeah. Gothamist has picked up some of that um, but just like local outlets Kings County politics uh, Brooklyn or some of these ones that I know but that exist all over the city in different forms play a really important function in taking things from this super opaque world of sort of community board bureaucratic decision making processes that have sign off and amplifying um, just the fact of their existence to Mm -hmm. the more broad general public yeah yeah I think yeah that actually is a really good point because um, even as someone that I sort of pride myself on being involved and like I haven't been to a community board meeting ever you you wouldn't have they yeah. they're super duper boring <laughs> right well I've I've watched sometimes I'll put it on the TV like yeah. they they broadcast old ones on one channel just one of the do, WNY yeah. channels yeah, yeah. Um, we only get like 13 channels so yeah. <laughs> sometimes if I'm like just need background noise I'll put that on and yeah it's like so it's like boring. Mind numbingly boring. It's like <laughs> but also really business interesting. at 434 Lincoln Place has applied for a liquor license, this, that, the other. Right. There's neighborhood residents who have complained because of this, that, and those. It's yeah. It's like on, it'll be on filming the person next to the person talking, and I think they know they're on camera and they're just like, so dead-eyed like not they're boring meetings they're and sometimes too. they are hours and hours yeah. and hours long right. yeah but they're important but it's and important. That, and that's yeah. why like it's bureaucracy when people complain about bureaucracy they complain about restraint yeah. ultimately right but it's necessary and you know the back then the robert moses the bqe era like that was avant-garde cutting edge in some ways because you're dealing with a vehicle something that was really mm-hmm. still with 20 30 years old and yeah. you know you think about while we'd like to believe and I, I do believe that it, generally the consciousness is in a better place than where it was before there are all sorts of other areas of avant-garde like technology and things where it's still going to be a very small collection of people mm-hmm. there isn't anything set up to like allow public comment on it and yeah. we're really at the whims of whatever's going on in their head yes. unless there's some sort of miracle process happening where they're questioning each other which doesn't always mm-hmm. happen you know and it took us decades to get from the point of Robert Moses saying, these are where the highways should be, we're going to destroy these areas, we're going to build our highways. It took us decades from starting that to realizing that there should, in fact, be community boards. Right. Com- right. Community boards are a recent phenomena. They came around in, I believe, the 60s in New York City. Um, and it was in response to things like this of right. of the city government deciding without anyone's input on the public level that they will be destroying a swath of their neighborhood um, that there was advocacy around the fact that community boards should exist um, and that there should be public processes that need to happen in order for planning decisions to be made yeah that's interesting i mean i think even like as we're talking about changing the actual physical infrastructure of the BQE and that area. I also think at the same time, there needs to be some sort of like restructuring planning of how the community can be engaged. And I don't yes. know that that necessarily would happen top down, but there needs to be replanning kind of, all of planning. Needs to, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
there's some people in New York who call for the dissolution of um, community boards that they should be abolished because they are often seen as being highly unrepresentative of the communities which they purport mm -hmm. to represent. Um, community board membership in general skews much older, generally wealthier, uh, much higher percentage of homeowners than the actual demographics of the communities that they represent. Mm. Sometimes it skews wider depending on the neighborhoods. Um, this is a huge problem yeah. and you know you two are pretty involved people you didn't necessarily you know, you're not necessarily going to community board meetings you know like yeah. these are not open forums in the way that we imagine open forums to be now especially in an era of the internet and and kind of the broadcasting systems that we now have available to us right we kind of need to make it like a 10 lane highway to, to create to get induced into, engagement yes. <laughs> I mean, you're right, we do. We need to get it to, it's almost hard to ignore and avoid the fact mm -hmm. that your civic participation is important in this process, which is very far from where we are now. Yeah. yeah. I personally believe that community boards, while they are frustratingly um, obsolete in, in many uh, senses, I don't think that they should be abolished, but I think in, instead they should really be strengthened uh, in the aspect that they need to actually be representative of the places they are and that they need to really broadcast out more actively mm. to more people who live in the community what's going on, why it's happening, and that they have an option to give their input. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like people don't even know that they can. And I guess just to like circle us back to this highway I think that was probably the case then too like the people in Brooklyn Heights knew that they had an opportunity to speak up about it and a lot of these other people where the highway was cutting through probably either didn't know that they had an opportunity didn't know that their voices mattered their voices didn't matter to some degree you know not in my opinion but into the opinions of the people building it and then there were sort of like repercussions for speaking up unless you were wealthy and had citizenship and had all these like yeah, and very too. solid it's important. placement for yeah. yourself. and Yeah, we need to be, uh, I think, pretty active in recognizing how big race was a factor in this because uh, it would be a lie to say that Brooklyn Heights was the only community that organized around not wanting a highway through their yeah. neighborhood and had the collective power to stop it. You know, the neighborhoods that were destroyed because of the Cross Bronx Expressway were organizing too, but they were completely ignored because they were black, poor people. And Robert Moses and the people in power at the time knew that they didn't have necessarily the clout, the power, the sway with people who were powerful in order to stop them from doing this thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. I read one quote, and maybe it was from that his biography the power broker i think that might have been where it's from but it was from someone in the red hook neighborhood who was italian and i guess was an immigrant and was saying that him and his family couldn't risk going to city hall over a highway or over anything really because they might lose their home they might get you know sent away mm -hmm. and that robert moses was city hall yeah so to even engage with it was like mm -hmm engaging with a dangerous situation. Yeah, he wielded so much power um, at the height of his career. He was in charge of multiple agencies. I can't remember what mayor it was, but when a new mayor was coming in, Robert Moses was heading this, that, and the other agency. And, and this mayor had come in on a platform of saying, we're going to reform a lot of this stuff, and I'm going to like pull Robert Moses out of this position. And, you know, first days on the job, Robert Moses... <laughs> walks into his office and makes it quite clear to this person that like you can't you cannot remove me wow uh, like i am too powerful i hold too much power in these city functions these state functions for you to remove me from these offices so okay i'll make a concession here and i'll step down from this post but like that's that's for show wow wow yeah it's wild so uh moving on to the personal with respect to the bqe yeah and maybe a I put all, put all of us on the spot here. Okay. If, if think of, because you, you just referenced, you know, driving your friends along. Yeah. Uh, you said you bring them to the promenade. Or, are there different sections that stick out to you or different experiences in general, either actually tra uh, traversing it or walking underneath it or anything that, you know, comes to mind when I bring that up? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I talked about it earlier, but this, the experience of crossing Hamilton Avenue <laughs> under the BQE is, is an impactful one for me. The other thing is the quality of the space created under that very, very high viaduct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's the tallest elevated highway in North America. Really? If not the world, I don't know about the world, but wow. in North America, I'm pretty certain. Um, it is like 80 feet up there or something crazy. Um, it's not quite clear to me why it was raised so high. This is the one right here? Yeah, right yeah, yeah. here, right out the yeah. window that we're looking at. It's it's a very, very high elevated highway. But because of that, I've taken all these photos from different angles of like the piers holding up the, the highway there because I think that there is a lot of potential in this huge amount of vertical space that exists to yeah. do something kind of interesting under mm -hmm. the highway, whether it's like hanging gardens or something cool. Mm. But there's like, there's potential I think there. So that's one place I think about. Um, another place for some reason is uh, the when the BQE is in a trench running through parts of Williamsburg. Yeah. Oh yeah. Some reason, like I cross over that a lot and for some reason it kind of, it's, you know, it's in my mind a lot. <laughs> when I think about the BQE, that's one of the sections that I actually do think about. One other place, uh, I guess this isn't a personal one, but I'll bring it up yeah, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, the Pulaski Bridge. No, mm. I'm sorry, not the Pulaski the Bridge. Kosciuszko? 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 Yes. Kosciuszko? Yes. Also, I, I how do you say, say that? I, I can never, I'm not the person never know to ask. how to say it. Okay. Yeah, I think you need to ask. When I was growing up person. on the... Uh, Kosciuszko, maybe? When I was growing up on the radio, they used to say Kosciuszko. Kosciuszko. And then somewhere along the land, la line, they changed to Kosciuszko. Yeah, and like it depends they, who's saying it. Yeah, I yeah. think it's like an accent. Yeah, I, I, these is what these I days thought, I say Kosciuszko. Kosciuszko. That's, right. that's what I say. It's named after. It's named after like a Revolutionary War general. Yeah, yeah. A, um, I think he was a Polish. So we'll yeah, he was Polish. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm Polish, so maybe how I. You gotta <laughs> ask. Yeah, so you're Bob a quarter Polish. Ask so. Bobshi. I'll ask. Yeah. yeah, I'll ask my aunt and her yeah. mom. <laughs> I, uh, I yeah. say Kosciuszko. I don't. I think that's totally wrong. But yeah. What do you think about that? The redesign. I think the redesign is pretty spectacular, honestly. I think it's, it's nice. <laughs> it's cool. Um, it's like one of the reasons they redesigned that bridge is because the, the grade, the elevation going up to the old bridge was apparently too steep so that trucks started to have to slow down when they were going up. Oh. And that oh was like gosh. causing backups on the BQE like for miles and miles in either wow. direction. Oh, wow. So part of, the, part of the specifications of this new bridge are that it, it doesn't have such a, a steep grade. Mm. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons I like it as a cyclist is there's a beautiful new bicycle path that exists yeah. oh, on yeah. the new bridge. Uh, but I think, uh, honestly, it's quite stunning of a bridge uh, for all the... So one thing about the BQE is it's a state road. The city mm -hmm. actually doesn't have a lot of control over the BQE and all of the things that go on with it and its construction. This is, this is state DOT stuff that happens. Yeah. Uh, so when you're looking at the new Kajusko Bridge, you, you got to look to Andrew Cuomo and the folks up in Albany for, for kind of the, the impetus to get that made. Um, Cuomo has a lot of crazy vanity projects that I think are terrible ideas, uh, but I think yeah. that they did a pretty good job with that bridge. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. Even, I'm I sure even he would find... love for us to be looking to him to <laughs> yeah. anytime he can get mentioned. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I even find the crazy light show that it does yes. to be like kind it. of endearing. I mean, yeah. it's tacky, it, but it's I. But also, like, I like it. You yeah. know? If you're gonna do like, you know how on the the FDR Drive, how they painted the whole underside mauve. Yeah. Oh yeah. I uh -huh. love that. Yeah. <laughs> Why wouldn't they have done that? Why not right. make it look why better? Not? Yeah, yeah. If yeah. you can make it fun. Yeah. Why not? We need a little fun. Yeah. So I think the light show is great. The the suspension system it uses, which is that single beam, mm -hmm. is cool. Yeah. It's very nice. Yeah. 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 I was thinking about it yesterday. I mean, you know, compared to what the old bridge looked like. I feel like it looks closer to the Sydney Opera House than it looks to the old bridge. Yeah. Like it, it really of art. <laughs> has some interesting yeah, shapes going on there. Yeah. yeah, and part of that is kind of the trend in current bridge construction. If yeah, you see that, every new bridge around yeah. the world, it's basically that style of yeah, suspension because yeah. oh, it's, really? it's sleek, it looks yeah. good. Yeah. 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 Is oh. it the same type of bridge as the Verrazano? Uh, not know? in terms of its suspension. Oh, okay. So the Verrazano Bridge is two piers. There's kind of a valley that happens with mm -hmm. the suspension cables in the middle. Uh, the difference with the Kajusko Bridge is it's one pier center, and then there's straight, um, oh. straight cables that extend from that pier and go out to hold the roadway up. Oh, okay. 
Okay, um, so it's still a suspension bridge, it's still but a it's suspension. a different I think it's type actually cheaper suspension. to build this new version. Oh, interesting. Uh, one crazy thing about the Brooklyn Bridge is it uses two different types of suspension. You know how on the Brooklyn Bridge there's like a lattice that's created by the by the um, cables mm -hmm. on the bridge? So it actually uses both the kind of valley suspension where the cables go straight down to hold up the roadway and also the the kind of diagonal suspension cables oh. so it's like double engineered in a way it's it's like way stronger than it ever ever needs to be <laughs> <laughs> but it was the first bridge suspension bridge built that long yeah they like wanted to make huge. sure it wasn't gonna fall yeah yeah, yeah. 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 i'm glad i'm i'm always scared yeah. over bridges so that makes me feel even safer i think it's the only bridge. bridge like that though like, Probably. Uh, there's no other bridge, at least in New York City, I know, yeah. that uses both suspension methods. Yeah, we haven't seen it yet, and we did hit 12 bridges last week. Yeah. So <laughs> we'll keep you posted if we go over the other bridges and find one that's And then like if that. I remember right, the old Kajusko bridge was, was uh, like a truss bridge. It was like a big mm. metal yeah. beams, I think, yeah. and crosses, right? Yeah. That was not a cable suspension bridge. No, no, right. I don't believe so. Yeah, yeah that was a big, heavy-duty yeah. duty guy. Yeah. Um, I also really like think about that area. Well, actually, okay, so when I think about the BQE, I forget about that trenched area, and then I remember it, and I'm like, oh, right. It's kind of in the queue section. I wish section, I could forget that. Mostly. Although, I guess it is, there's more, there's another trench area here, right? There is. Right so over in Oh, that's in actually what Carol I was, Gardens. yeah, oh, okay. that's what I'm thinking of, and that's like, my main memory of that is like when Mike and I were first dating, Mike had yeah. a car for a few years and drive, he was living in Williamsburg. So we had to drive on the BQE all the time yeah. and driving back in the rain mm -hmm. and like knowing that I need to get over to get off at Hamilton, but not getting over too far, too fast because it's flooded. Yeah. And, <laughs> and like looking at the poor souls that like didn't know the trick that the road would be flooded on the right <laughs> side. Like <laughs> That's you, the you thing I it. think of the most. Yeah. That's the thing about the BQE too. Too. like it's it's such a heavily used stretch of road everybody who's driven or, or just like I, I mean I don't drive but like everybody who's been on the BQE like knows every little quirk about it right. yeah. <laughs> yeah totally yeah. and that's honestly that's part of the fun like I know it's poorly <laughs> constructed and I know you know I was also reading um, earlier this this week that or this this morning actually that one of the main problems because they didn't know much about highways was that the entrance and exits were built way too short oh and so i was you, like lose speed before you come yeah, out the exactly turn. and there's a lot of like stop signs yeah and i read that and i was like oh okay i am a good driver it's not because <laughs> i'm and i i i am a good driver hello um <laughs> but i always i would get like so stressed especially i think the flushing exit is just like Boop! Yeah. You're just like, oh, and there's trucks, and you're like, ah! <laughs> I mean, a lot of the BQE was built in the 50s, right? Uh huh. And um, that predates um, federal regulation as to how highways ought to be built, right? right. The, highway, the Highway Act was in the 60s, mm -hmm. and, and as part of that, they laid out, like, okay, ramps can only be this steep, and turns right. have to be this wide so that a car going 60 miles an hour can easily make it. That was, none of those things existed for the BQE, so they were right. just like, you need to turn off here. <laughs> yeah. And they've changed. Apparently, they have extended some of them, yeah. but they're still still tight. So that's a that's a hard thing. So every time the state DOT needs to do work on, on the BQE, they need to bring it up to federal standards. They can't right. like just fix the old way because mm. it's no longer in compliance with the law. Oh, so of if they choose to yeah. do any work, then they have to do a lot of work, a lot of work. Oh, which is something that has prevented the the state from wanting to do any repairs. Yeah, uh, it's a factor in um, the repair of the triple cantilever as well. I went to some of those uh, meetings early on where they were trying to figure out like, what are we gonna do with this? Like, how do we repair it? Which of these many options works? And just the fact that you need to bring it all up to speed is a huge, huge thing, yeah. making it a challenge to do. Same thing exists with the MTA and subway stations. Every time they do any work in a subway station, you need to make it ADA accessible. Right. So if a station doesn't already have an elevator, they don't want to do any work there because it means they have to put in an elevator. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's, yeah, that's very complicated because in some ways I think that's great that yeah, everything right. should be improved to the quality that we need it to be now. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, yeah, like, can we also just improve things 
a little. Like things Makes also sense just are falling apart. <laughs> You're like, yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, of course, I'm gonna make a policy that every time we do work, we should bring it up to standards. Yeah. And then, as as the person sitting there in the agency budget office, you're like, okay, well, you you don't have you know, sixty million dollars of capital needs. Honestly, with the MTA, it's billions. But right. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What are your favorite? You asked. Both yeah, of us. You I would say that I my uh, the apartment that I lived for eight years was near the Meeker exit, mm -hmm. right on the other side of the Kosciuszko. So, uh, you know, I would drive in from Long Island over the bridge and have memories of that. Also, just that whole area that separates, uh, I guess, East Williamsburg from Williamsburg, if you want to say that designation, or just the portion mm -hmm. that goes through Williamsburg. Yeah. That, just walking under that to get to the McCarran Greenpoint area a lot. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of fond memories of that as so, you know, that's where I get the appreciation for the aesthetics. Mm -hmm. uh, driving down here, you know, to when we were dating, that was always nice. And I mean, really, you know, uh, you talk about train relationships or, you know, the idea, oh, they're too far away neighborhood wise. Yeah. I mean, that having a vehicle probably was one of the reasons we are together <laughs> yeah. is because we I were able to go together. <laughs> yeah, I made, a, I made like an Instagram post this morning that we're doing this route and I wrote that it was essential to the beginning of our relationship because we were basically in a long distance relationship from <laughs> Gowanus to Williamsburg yeah, if we yeah. didn't have a car to use. <laughs> you know, the people who I've had serious relationships with have always been in the same community district as me. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, I mean, I definitely, I, I have a, a fondness for it. And uh, oh, also the, uh, the BQE uh, movie, which is not specific to my experience with it, but I, I mentioned it yesterday and we watched it, the Sufjan Stevens uh, music movie. I, it doesn't have a narrative. It's just a 40 minute film that kind of uses a triptych setup and they have different uh, visuals of different sections of the BQE as seen through d in different ways. And that is something that I find inspirational as far as like filmmaking. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really compelling way to tell a story and also just a, a compelling way to have, you know, make a piece of orchestral music and, and yeah. find a way to, to give it a new, a new tier, you know, cantilever structure of, of artwork Mm -hmm. where there's just multiple expressions going on. And, and yeah, I, I admire things that are able to tell a story without actually telling me a story. Yeah. And, and yeah. That, that movie it for me does it. It also probably does a little bit of that romanticism of or romanticizing of something that isn't quite so beautiful, you know, yeah. which, which I think is beautiful in itself, again, as an aesthetic experience, mm -hmm. seeing yeah. the trucks sort of merging together in that way in the film is so beautiful. Whereas if you're seeing the trucks on the highway, you're just like, okay, it's trucks Get out of my highway. way. Yeah. yeah. Beep, beep. I need to get off. Yeah. 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 I think, um, I don't know if this is true for every New Yorker, but I think there's an extent to which we, we find beauty in the things that wouldn't traditionally be considered beautiful because we relate to them as, as being part of home. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I would say that too. And it's like necessity in a way. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think this is a good point to stop, even though we could talk for another hour and a half. Sure. We are at an hour and a half. So yeah. thanks so much for joining us. This yeah, is great. This was tons of fun. Thank yeah. you yeah. both very much for having me on the podcast, having me on the walk this morning. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Oh, it's been wonderful. Yeah. All right, well, that's all for this week. Thanks so much for tuning in, either through the ears or through the eyes or both of them. Uh, we always love having you all around. And if this is your first time around, please uh, give a like and a subscribe. Uh, share it around with folks. We are only going to be doing more themed versions of this podcast. So uh, lots of interesting stuff. Hopefully we can communicate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm really excited about all these themes. I feel like we're learning a lot about uh, the city in more depth than... We previously had been when it was more of an overview, so it's really fun, and we hope that you stick around and have a happy 2021 that we're all in now. And thanks for watching. Bye. Bye. <laughs>